As the 90s really heated up for computers, a lot of manufacturers were in the middle of it trying their best to compete. One of those brands vying for home market supremacy was AST. Almost at the peak of their popularity, they made the Advantage Adventure 8100P. Join me as we take a closer look at this machine and see if it will fit the bill as a DOS gaming powerhouse. Welcome back to Rick's Random Retro, where we hit speeds in the triple digits. I found this machine by a local online marketplace and it actually is strikingly familiar to one I had growing up. While I had an Advantage 822, the specs are near identical. We're dealing with a Pentium 100MHz with 16MB of RAM and a 1GB hard drive. We have a 1MB S3 Verge video card integrated into the motherboard as well as a Sound Blaster Vibra 16 card occupying one ISO slot. I found it surprisingly hard to find much information about this particular model online, but did locate some stores selling it in ads from 90s magazines. Here's our machine, as we can see it retailed for around 2600 bucks in 1995. That's about 4200 accounted for inflation. Yikes. At the time it was not a cheap machine, let's just say that. This particular machine is also equipped with a network card, modem, as well as a SCSI card. Based on where I got it, I think it served as a business machine for many years, eventually being retired. All in all, the condition of it really is great based on how old this is. When it was actually allowed to be retired from active duty is unknown, but however it was stored it was fairly dust free. Let's just say I've seen way, way worse. So let's take this thing apart and see what we're dealing with on the inside. This particular case design makes you undo a few screws allowing the entirety of the metal sides to come off. It's not too bad, but it does really like to snag as you lift the cover off. Doing a quick look on the insides, here we have some separation of the individual areas. I do get the impression with these metal bracings that it survived being run over by a tank. They certainly don't build them like this anymore. Next, the hard drive bay is hidden behind a plate from the back, held on with a couple of screws. Our drive now being exposed, we'll need to detach it first, allowing a fairly simple extraction as it rides on slider rails. And here's our Western Digital Caviar Drive. We'll have to see if it still works. Having done that, we'll have to take off the bottom plate first to allow access to the expansion card bay. I did say built well, not with easy access in mind. With the case open up, we now have full access to our cards and even our CPU hiding under the blue heatsink. Let's get these cards out of here and see what we have. First, we have an Adaptic 1510 SCSI card. We likely won't need this card for our machine, so we'll leave it out. Then we have an Intel 10100 network card. That will come in handy for sure, so we'll use that again. Next, here is our Sam Blaster Vibra 16 sound card. Now this certainly isn't the top of the line when it comes to ISA sound cards, but we're going to give it a try. Here is our modem, which we'll leave out of this one for now. Although I do have a landline. Hey, I like retro, and a landline at this point, yeah, that's pretty retro. Get off my lawn. With the expansion cards out, we can now plainly see our riser card, Intel chipset, as well as our integrated S3 video card. Next, let's see if we can get the CPU heatsink off so we can clean it up and apply some fresh thermal paste. It's held on with some force, and the motherboard doesn't have any bracing here, surprisingly. Yeah. 
And there we have almost 25 year old thermal paste. Tasty. The CPU pops out quite simply after racing the zero and searching for its lover. That way we can give it a nice clean as well. Now let's remove the drive aid normally holding hard drives. For what I can tell it's usually secure with a screw but that was missing here. It does slide out after giving it a nice push. The expansion card bay is separated from the rest of the case by a divider that also holds a fan. That does come out easily enough after just a little bit of elbow grease and detaching the associated fan wiring. Following that we'll remove the PCI and ISA riser card by gently rocking it back and forth before pulling straight up. As we do so you can also see these 16 megabytes of RAM hiding behind it. Based on this layout reaching the RAM is no quick job let's just say that. Since we're already here I decided to replace the CMOS battery as well. I'm going to guess it's long since dead at this point. Our machine is now taken apart about as far as I'll go here. It's really not that bad at all considering its age. Everything is reasonably clean and I don't see any obvious problems at this stage. Using our trusty anti-static brush we'll simply give it a good uh, brushing. The low dust accumulation on this machine looking at the age is actually impressive. It may very well have been in some sort of server room for most of its life. That's really the only other time I've seen a machine this clean. Really the dustiest part of this machine was probably the ricer card but it cleaned up real easy too. Some components like network card were even dust free, no brushing required. The next step here is to clean off this really old thermal paste off the processor. It was pretty stubborn but at least it hadn't turned into complete hardened goop as I've seen elsewhere. Quite a bit of scrubbing and it cleaned up pretty nice. I'm using a simple alcohol solution here and that seemed to do the trick to us fine. Notice the sticker on here at the end which I'm assuming is to provide some level of heat transfer. I'll leave that on for the time being. Now then let's start putting everything back together by inserting the CPU back into its socket. We'll apply some fresh thermal paste and get the heatsink back on as well. Now honestly I'm just guesstimating, yes I use that word, as I'm unsure on the exact purpose of the pad on the processor. Also yes I likely installed the heatsink the opposite way here but I don't imagine it'll have a huge impact on performance either way. Next we need to reseat the riser card that allows our expansion cards to go back in. Following that we'll get the bracing with the fan back in as well. Then we get our sound card. And network card in place. And since I like neat we'll fill in the blank slots with some covers just to keep things tidy. Now we need to install our hard drive in the rear drive bay. We'll need to take note of the hard drive specs for later here in case it's not auto detected in the BIOS. After hooking the drive back up we'll want to reinstall the back cover plate as well. The bottom chassis cover goes on next. Finally let's get the cover back on. 
As mentioned earlier, this one definitely is prone to snagging, which can make this a bit of an exercise in frustration. Oh, we got it though. Now the case itself is actually not too bad. However, as some may recall from the start of the video, we have a nice number 2, insert joke here, written with Sharpie on the front. We'll take some alcohol to it and after a little bit of elbow grease applied, it indeed virtually is all gone. I gave the rest of the case a simple clean and I think it looks pretty darn great for its age. Save for that slightly yellowed floppy drive, it's almost like it was plucked straight from the 90s. So, what is the next step after this? Well, you'll want to join me for part 2 where we'll get the machine running, set it up, and of course check out some games. I'm pretty excited for this, it really is almost the same computer I had as a kid. Did you also get started on something similar, and if so, what sort of games did you play on it? Be sure to leave a comment as I'd love to hear about your own early computing experience, and it may even affect what games I try out for part 2. If you like this video, perhaps you'll enjoy some of my other ones as well. This is Rick, thank you very much for watching, and remember everyone, stay classy.